Now I'm happy to introduce both the writers that are here today to talk to you. And the name of this session is called um, Books Boys Love. And here to talk about those kind of books are um, Fred Bowen, who is uh, a writer of 19 books for boys. They're all primarily, they're all sports related. In fact, there are nine baseball books, two soccer, two football, um, mostly fiction, but one nonfiction, which is the story of Ted Williams and his um, last season. And he's also writes the kids column for the Post and has been for the last 13 years. And our other writer is Tommy Greenwall, and he is the author of the Charlie Joe Jackson books. And I can't wait for him to tell you about them. They're based on um, some real experience for him. Um, there are three books in the series, and uh, he is also the writer of a screenplay called Sweet Emotion, and he's the also has a play that's been performed all over the place. It's called John and Jin, and he's the lyricist, I guess, for that, for that piece. And what I'm gonna ask them both to do is come on up and talk about themselves a little bit and about the books and things, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Should I go first? I'm going first, all right, good. Actually, maybe uh, hold that. I'll just do it up here. All right, good morning. It's great to have everybody here. That's right, my name's Fred Bowen and I do a whole bunch of things. Uh, one thing is I do is I write a series of kids sports books, and what they do is they combine sports fiction and sports history, and there's always a chapter of sports history in the back, and I love sports history, which is one of the reasons I brought along these. These are replicas. Can any of the kids in our audience Tell me what a replica is. Right. There you go. That's right. It's a copy or a model of something. In other words, you can have replica chairs. You can have replica cars. Some people have replica furniture, the, things like that. These are replicas of the first baseball gloves. When people started playing baseball in this country, and now they think it's about 200 years ago, somebody discovered a few years ago that uh, there was a, a law in Western Massachusetts that you could not play baseball too close to a church. And so they figured people must have been playing baseball 200 years ago. but. When people first started playing baseball all that time ago, you know what they wore on their hands? Nothing. They wore nothing on their hands. And you know why they wore nothing on their hands? They weren't very smart. <laughs> and then somebody got the very smart idea. I guess that's the big train, right? You know, uh, Walter Johnson and the big train. Should I stop? Can you hear me? That's all right, we'll keep talking. Somebody got the very smart idea that his hands were killing him. In other words, is it coming right here? Wait a second. Oh, I was getting a little scared there. Wow. So, I hope it's not a freight train, which, by the way, is a tremendous book by Donald Cruz, picture book. Okay, I think I think the, the, the most of the stuff is by there. But somebody got the idea and said, "Man, my hands are killing me," and so what he did was he took work gloves or. Uh, bricklayer gloves and he snipped off the tops of the fingers. Now another question for the kids out there, why do you think he snipped off the tops of the fingers? Does anybody know? Why would it? Right there, go ahead. What's he going to use his fingers for? Right, to grip it, because after he catches the ball in the middle, what's he going to do with it? He's going to throw it, of course. He's going to need his fingers to throw it. Now, 
We'll ask this of the adults and the kids out there. Who owns a baseball glove out there? Everybody who isn't raising their hands, shame on you. <laughs> this has been a wonderful sport in our culture for years. These are replicas of baseball gloves that were used 140 years ago. This is a baseball glove or a replica of a baseball glove that was used 100 years ago and it is a Honus Wagner model baseball glove which brings up the question and you can't answer it. <laughs> Who was Honus Wagner? What do you think his job was? He was a baseball player, of course. He's got his own glove. In fact, he was a tremendous baseball player. He's probably the best shortstop from 1900 to 1917. And he wore a glove like this. Now, take a look at this glove and think about the gloves we have now. What is different about this glove and the ones we have now? In the back, shout for Mr. Bowen because there's a train going by. <laughs> exactly. The fingers in our gloves now are all connected. This, the glove, all the fingers are not connected. This is a 1910 glove. In fact, it took him about 30 to 40 more years to figure out, hey, maybe we should connect the fingers. What else is different about the glove? You, I was about to say, you guys have gloves like this? You should get a new glove. Go ahead. Oh, the strap in the back. Exactly. And look at how big, look at how big the hole is. Now, what they usually do is they cover it up. But what else is different about it? Oh, this thing. This thing. Yeah, now... It's just, yeah, it's sort of a strip of leather here. Now what they have is they have, uh, they have a nice webbing where you can catch the ball. So this one is just, it's, you really have to catch it in the middle, and then you've got to put your hand right over it. Is there anybody old enough to remember when the, the coaches used to say two hands, two hands all the time? Well, it's really because the gloves, you couldn't catch the ball. Uh, with two hands way back in the corner and tell me what else is different about this glove It's what oh You are absolutely right. You said it's more flat than curvy. That's right What they do now is they shape the glove so that the ball goes boom right into the glove and you can close your hand right over it the reason I'm bringing these up is because I love the history of the games we play. In other words, I like to find out, well, gee, they didn't always play the games they, uh, the way they are now. And so I have lots of different books about it, and I always have a chapter of uh, uh, sports history in the back. This one's the latest one. It's called Perfect Game, and it's about a kid who wants to pitch a perfect game. So some of what I tell you in the back is about uh, the 23 people who have pitched a perfect game, which is no hits, no walks, nobody getting on base. This is a soccer book. It's called Go for the Goal. And what I tell you about in the back of that book is about the 1999 Women's World Cup team who had a coach whose only job was to make the women on the team better teammates. And that was one of the reasons they were such a great team. This one is a, called Quarterback Season. Is What it's about is about a kid who is, has to write a journal for school, and he's not excited about it. And so his teacher asks him, what do you like? And he says, well, I like football. I'm going to be the quarterback. Well, he says, write about that. And there was a famous guy, 1967, wrote a book, a a uh, football book that was on the bestseller list of the New York Times for 37 weeks. And the last one is about real hoops. And all of those books are uh, available at the Politics and Prose. But I should stop talking so my teammate can get up. And, uh, and then we'll take questions after that. But thank you all for coming out. And uh, buy a baseball glove if you don't have one.
Hi, you guys. Whoa, 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 whoa. Thanks, Fred. And thanks for having me, everybody, at the Gaithersburg Book Festival. My name is Tommy Greenwald. Uh, I love sports, and I definitely do own a baseball glove. Um, and I played soccer, but, but my books are, are not about sports. They're about a boy and his love of a lot of things, including sports, and his non-love of one major thing, and that's reading. And uh, his name is Charlie Joe Jackson. And uh, Charlie Joe Jackson's Guide to Not Reading is the first book. Um, the first thing I need, uh, can I get one volunteer from the audience to hold my water? This is an important job. Okay, you come on up, you come on up. Bravo! Wow, wow. right. Here you go. This is important, whenever I want water, come on, well, no, you can go back to your seat. But, but, but whenever I want water, you have to bring it up and, and give me a sip, okay? It's, it's a, for instance, now I would like some water. Come on, step on it. We don't have all day. Um, you also, you need to open it. Okay, run along. Very good. Run along, son. Now, I was a real reader growing up myself. I was, who, who, well, let's take a poll. Who likes reading here? You're at a book festival, so my hunch is that we've got a lot of readers. Is there anybody here who, who's not crazy about reading? Come on, admit it. One guy in the back. My water helper, not a reader. I grew up, like, like most of you guys, I was a huge reader. I, uh, I remember the first book I loved when I was about five years old was this picture book called Are You My Mother? Do you guys remember that book? He's still in print, I think, right? Who, what's it, you remember what that book's about? Who remembers what that book's about? You already volunteered. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a bird, a baby bird. And the baby bird falls out of his nest while his mother's out looking for food. He goes all over the place. At one point he asks the bulldozer, are you my mother? So there may have been some eyesight issues there, but, but it was an adorable book. And I read it about 4,692 times when I was a kid. And it was the, well, that might be a slight exaggeration, more like 4,329 times. But it was, I read it over and over, it made me fall in love with books. And then I grew up, got married, had kids of my own, one of whom is here, that I will identify him later. Oh, spilling the beans. This is my son, Charlie. Wave to the fans, Charles. <laughs> I grew up loving reading. I had three kids of my own, Charlie, Joe, and Jack. Okay, hated reading. Grew up five years old, they wouldn't mind being read to, but by the time they were seven, eight, nine years old, they'd all decided, Charlie first had decided that he wasn't gonna be a reader, and then of course Joe and Jack kind of fell in line and decided that they weren't gonna be readers. The next thing I knew, I had three real adamant non-readers on my hands. And this was, this. every parent and every teacher knows how frustrating it is to deal with kids who don't like to read. You guys are the lucky ones out there since you've got kids who voluntarily came to a book festival, but there's a lot of parents out there like me who have been struggling trying to get their kids to read. And you try everything. First you try to bribe them. I bribed all my kids with um, milkshakes, trips to the sports store to get brand new baseball gloves, which Fred would approve of. Uh, one time, one of my middle kids was a, a reptile fan, so I said, if you read two books about reptiles, I will get you an iguana. And he read the books, I got the iguana, we had an iguana named Leo, and then he kind of stopped reading again after that. So it's even when you bribe them to read, it doesn't turn them into readers, it turns them into kids who like stuff and realize they can get it by reading. So after about five or 10 years of trying to get my kids to read and looking for books about them, kids who were great kids, because I don't, I don't judge kids who don't like to read. They're awesome, just as awesome as any other kind of kid, and I had three of them of my own, so I'm obviously biased, but I thought my three kids were great kids. I couldn't find a book that I felt they would relate to as, as dedicated non-readers. So I started out, and I've always been a writer. Um, I wrote a musical and some screenplays, but I'd never thought about writing for kids before or writing for boys. So I said, you know what, maybe I should 
take a crack at coming up with a story about a kid like my own kids. And my first attempt was a picture book called A Boy Who Hated Reading. And it was kind of designed for the Are You My Mother age, age group. And I showed it around to some agents and editors. And the comments were all the same. This is an interesting idea for a book, but you should make it for slightly older children. Because when kids are four and five, they associate reading with time with mom and dad. And it's a social activity. And it's still kind of fun. It's when they're eight, nine, 10, 11, where they where they are going to make up their minds when reading becomes a, a, a solitary activity, whether they're going to do it or not. So why don't you take a crack at writing a book for non-readers of a middle grade age, a middle school age? And so that's when I came up with the idea of the character of Charlie Joe Jackson. Um, my kids, Charlie, Joe, and Jack, are all kind of equal parts Charlie Joe Jackson. There's parts of all of them in this kid. Charlie, Charlie himself says that the good parts of Charlie Joe are based on him and the annoying parts are based on Joe and Jack. Probably true, um, especially since they're not here and he is. Um, and uh, that's when I had the idea that I was going to write a book about a 12-year-old avowed non-reader who's a great kid. He's funny. He's likable. But his mission in life is to go through middle school without ever reading a book from cover to cover. And the first book is this one, Charlie Joe Jackson's Guide to Not Reading. It spells it all out right out there in the title. And what it is is a kind of an exercise in trickery um, because my goal with the title was to get kids like my own kids to see it in a store or a library and go, huh, that looks kind of interesting. I wouldn't mind picking that up. I'd like to read a book about how to avoid other books. And it starts out and has a lot of tips. On the cover it says, now with 25 exclusive non-reading tips. And it has a bunch of tips, like if you have to read, make sure the book has short chapters so you can tell your parents you read three chapters before bed and it only took you four minutes. And that's a tip my kids actually gave me. Um, and if your parents ever tell you you don't read, remind them all the ways you do read, menus, texts, IMs, video game instructions. But at the same time, it's a story that as it goes along, the chapters get a little bit longer and, and the story gets a little bit more involved, and it's about boys and girls and middle school crushes and fights and arguments, and his quest to avoid books leads him on this kind of wild journey throughout his year in middle school. And, I, and, I, and my goal is that kids who started out reading it thinking this was just how I was going to avoid books get wrapped up in a story and actually find that they've read a book and enjoyed it all the way through. So that's the kind of the background of the series. There's uh, two more books that have come out since this one, Charlie Joe Jackson's Guide to Extra Credit, in which he finds out that if you don't read during middle school, your grades are, are going to suffer. And his parents throw a huge fit and threaten to send him to academic summer camp. And he says, in a panic, if I get straight A's, can I avoid going to this camp? They laugh, then they say yes. And so the second book is about his efforts to avoid this summer camp. Well, sure enough, he ends up at the summer camp. And this third book, Charlie Joe Jackson's Guide to Summer Vacation, just came out. And it's about his three weeks at a summer camp called Camp Read a Bookie, where he is the only kid there who does not love learning. And he's been kind of the popular, well-adjusted, devil-may-care kid all through his life. And suddenly, he's the outsider at this place. And everybody looks at him strange, because he's the one that doesn't like to learn. And so he needs to figure out how he's going to survive in this place for three weeks. And, he, and he's determined to make the other kids a little bit more like him, less studious and more fun-loving. And they're determined to make him more like them, more studious and less fun-loving. And they kind of come to an interesting uh, resolution by the end of the book where they've each learned a little bit about how the other side lives. And that's the book that just came out. That's the story of Charlie Joe Jackson. Charlie, thank you so much for hating to read growing up because I never would have written these if he was a book lover. And now I have these books to try to get kids that were like my own kids to read a little bit more, boys and girls. I am, I am happy that kids who love to read also love these books. I've been lucky, and girls and boys are reading them uh, in equal measure. So in that sense, it's great. But the original goal was to get boy-reluctant readers to pick up a book and have a few laughs. So thanks so much, and we're happy to ask, answer any questions you guys have. Get that water. <laughs> uh, have my sons read all the books? Char well, I'll tell you, the, the dedication in my first book answers that question partly. I'll read it to you real quickly. Um, 
Kathy's my wife, so I dedicated it for Kathy, who gladly read several drafts of this book and helped make it better, and for Charlie, Joe, and Jack, who didn't. <laughs> and that's kind of the truth, but I, Charlie was good enough to, I, I, I ordered them to read this first one because I wanted to make sure it felt real, and the conversations in the lunchroom felt like conversations kids would have. When I started writing, my youngest was still in middle school, and I got them all to read enough of them to make sure that they rang true to that age set, but it's, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle, and, and they don't love to read now. They accept it a little bit more. Um, Charlie can even a answer that question, but my kids are not huge readers now, but they've begun the process to hopefully becoming readers. Can I jump in real quick here? And one piece of advice, I see parents out there. He was talking about how uh, kids associate, young kids associate reading with time with their parents. There's no reason to stop reading with your children once they become independent readers. Uh, we, you know, in my, my family, we read books together, uh, things like that. It's a good way to talk to your kids without having to put them on the spot. Uh, in fact, there's a book, one of my books called Winners Take All, and what we do is a program at schools where the parents and the kids read the book together because the kid at the beginning of the book cheats to win a game. And then the question is, what's he gonna do? And the, uh, it brings up a very interesting conversation, which is, what would you do to win the game? Is it what the ref, and what is honesty in sports? Is it what the referee says, or what you know to be true? And it brings up a very, very interesting discussion within sports, but it's also a moral discussion where the parents sometimes, when we go to the schools, the parents find out, the kids will say, I wouldn't tell the truth, no. You know, but that's, I, I'd rather win the game. And that's, uh, it's very, very interesting uh, when that happens. So I would say, yeah, definitely keep reading with your kids, even when they become independent readers. We actually put on a play in our house just by reading the four, uh, uh, I think there are four or five characters in The Price by uh, Arthur Miller. And it's, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful play. And um, the kids were in high school, and they liked it. We just sat around and we read it for two hours. It was cool. Any other questions? Somebody has to have questions, or do you want to put questions to us? Ah. Um, when you did the biography of uh, Ted, thank you. I was thinking Miller, because you just said Miller. Um, how do you narrow down the voluminous amount of material that you can find on somebody like that? I mean, well, the newspaper the, articles, the magazine sure. articles, the books? You don't read all that stuff. <laughs> uh, wait, really, uh, the book, and I'm holding up the book, as you can see, is very thin, and it's four kids. What it does is it concentrates on one aspect of uh, William's life, and that was when it, in his third season, he was hitting 400 for most of the season, and then his batting average started to drift down till it was, with two games to go, .39955, which, for the mathematically inclined out there, you can round up to be 400, and even his manager came to him and said, hey, Ted, why don't you sit out the last two uh, games of the season and you can be a 400 hitter? And Williams said no. He said that, you know, basically saying that would be the easy way out. And uh, so is that part of uh, Williams' life that I wanted to get. There's certainly more interesting parts of his, or there are not more interesting, but I think that there are other interesting parts of his life. For example, Ted Williams actually uh, served in two wars and crash landed a, uh, a jet fighter plane during the Korean War. So when you start to talk about, quote, sports heroes, uh, these people uh, who just happen to be able to be very good at a, uh, uh, a game, we tend to forget that they're in World War II, I believe it was Warren Spahn or Yogi Berra was in D-Day. You know, those guys were real heroes. So, any other questions?
How did you get inspired to be a author? Well, I'll take that one first, and, and Fred, will, Fred will jump in after. I, uh, I'd always been a writer. When I was a kid, I was a reader. When I was a kid, I was a writer. If you want to be a writer, you start by being a reader. I think anybody will tell you that. I'm sure Fred will agree. Um, and I wrote some, I wrote a musical. I wrote a musical when I was about 25. And then I said, well, do I want to write musicals or do I want to write other kinds of things too and see what happens? And I wrote a couple of screenplays and I wrote some short stories, but it was only when I had my own kids, Charlie, Joe, and Jack, and I had struggles trying to get them to read that I decided to become a writer for children. So I think the first thing, I think what I learned from that whole process is if you, if you need to write, you're going to be a writer. You might not find out exactly what it is you're going to end up writing for a while until you try something and then try something else and then maybe try something else. But you'll know inside your heart if you want to be a writer because you'll have to write. You'll want to create. You'll want to say things. You want to put things down on paper that hopefully other people will want to read. That doesn't necessarily mean the first thing you decide to write is what you're going to end up spending your life or most of your time writing, but you'll know you'll want to be a writer first, and then eventually you'll find out what it is you were meant to write. Well, it's interesting. Uh, when I was about 30 years ago, I was at a uh, cocktail party with my uh, wife, and she was a journalist, and her editor came up to me and said, Fred, you're funny. Uh, you like to tell stories, you love movies, how would you like to write movie reviews? So who goes to the movies here? I got paid to go to the movies. That is a cool job. Uh, when my kids, and then I did uh, movie reviews, I did video reviews, uh, and I really kind of got hooked on uh, being published because people, I was a lawyer for 30 years, and you'd be at those cocktail parties and somebody would say, Fred, what do you do? And I'd say, well, I'm a lawyer with the government, and I write movie reviews. And everybody says, oh, you write movie reviews. <laughs> Everybody's interested in that. And the people who say, oh, what part of the government do you work for, you just avoid them. <laughs> but the, um, uh, and then when my kids came along, much uh, like his uh, story, uh, I was reading sports books to my son. And I was thinking, these aren't very good. And I, I, I could write a better sports book than this. And so I wrote the first one was TJ's Secret Pitch. And I also told the publisher I could write, oh, I could write a whole series of these. And I remember she was from North Carolina. And she said after the first one, she said, Fred, you said you could write a whole bunch of these. And I said, yeah, I guess I did. <laughs> and so I wrote uh, like nine of them in five years. And then I got the column with the uh, Post, which is so much fun because you get to talk about anything you want. And people, I, I mean, I walked in here and somebody just says, oh, my family reads your column religiously. And so that, it makes you feel so good. It's so much more fun than being a lawyer. <laughs> you had a question way over there. Um, how do you, did you type the book or did you, uh, uh, write to make the uh, write the book. You mean write it down in on on pen and paper kind of thing? Yeah. Or did you type it on the computer? Okay. Well, I'll jump in first. Um, that's a good question because people also often ask me where do you write, when do you write, how do you write, and these days it's a tricky thing for me at least. Fred will Fred will answer um, with his own experiences, but. When, when I was a kid, you, in, or even in college, I would write on a typewriter. And a typewriter, anybody under 15 know what a typewriter is? <laughs> a typewriter had one function, to type. And you would type and you would write and that would be it, typewriter. Now, I write on a computer. What else is on that computer? The internet is on that computer. Twitter is on that computer. Cats playing poker with pigs is on that computer, on YouTube. <laughs> Anything, the entire world is right at your fingertips when you're writing. So the first thing you have to do, or the first thing that I have to do, is try to block everything out. Block out all those temptations. Block out the temptation to go see what's happening on the New York Times or the Washington Post website. Block out the temptation to check my email. It's a real challenge to write these days because you really need to focus. But I do do all my writing on the computer. I write 
write on the train going back and forth to my real job. I write at the bookstore. I write at the library. The one place I don't write is at home because I, home for me is where I relax and play with the dogs and watch TV and hang out. So I try to go elsewhere to do my writing. But I do it all on a computer. I'm going to show you the secret to writing. They're notebooks. All right. Uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, where you write. I used to, when, particularly when I was, hey, he's leaving. He doesn't want to know the secret to writing. <laughs> I can't believe it. All right. Okay. The heck with you. Um, <laughs> I'll show these kids. All you do is you write things down. It's just a list. It's a list of all the things you want to put in your book. And in fact, this notebook goes to this book. They don't look the same, do they? But I write down all the ideas that I want to put in the book, and then I go to the computer. And by that time, I have the, the book sort of figured out in my head and in this notebook. And so what you were talking about, all the distractions, you really want to write the book. All the distractions sort of come. It's an easy way to get rid of distractions. You just sit somewhere and imagine the book. And uh, so I always find that that has been helpful. I write my columns. I write those, by the way, if anybody could see this, it says WP40. Every column that I write, I start with a list. This one was about the Strasburg question, whether or not to sit down Steven, Steven Strasburg last year. And so I started to write down what I thought about it. It's a way to organize the way you think. You know what? The problem, as he was saying, with computers is everybody's just doing stuff, nobody's thinking. Take time to think. In other words, think, what is it that I think about Strasburg, um, what, sitting down Strasburg last year? And what I really thought was, good for them. They are following doctor's orders, and wouldn't it be nice if parents did the same, and coaches did the same thing with kids? You know that there are studies, you're not supposed to throw curveballs until you're 14, 15 years old. Take a look at the Little League series this year at the end of the August. Kids throwing curveballs. They're ruining their arms. Another thing, you're not supposed to play one sport the year round. The American Association of Pediatrics has written on this twice. What do kids do? They play soccer or basketball year round. Why? So they can become great 10-year-old players? There's no reason for that. There's none. We don't want to make great, let's say, 10-year-old mathematicians or great 10-year-old you know, physicists. You want to get them interested in it so when they become adults, they're good at it. You know, you don't, I mean, the fact that we have national championships for seven-year-olds is total insanity. That's what I think about it, but, and they're usually in the notebooks. <laughs> Another question. I, I have a question for each of you. Oh, it's, it's on. Sorry about that. Um, for Mr. Greenwald, you told us your favorite book when you were a little guy. I want to know what your favorite book was in middle school and then what you're reading now and what you've come to like. And should I do it one at a time and come back with Mr. Bowen's sure, question? I'll, I'll, okay. Go ahead. So he gets to be the one to think about it? <laughs> Is no, that I have a, no, no, I have a separate Let question. Me write it down. No, no. <laughs> the question for him is different. Oh, Separate question the, for him. Better be equally. He doesn't get to think. Let's see. Gosh, my favorite book in middle school. That's a tough one. I do remember reading this book called *The Bully of Barkham Street*. I don't even know if it's still in print, but but it was. You know, nowadays it's a bully. There's a bully of the week story in the news, and it's a huge problem. But it's not like it's a new problem. I mean, we need to be. We need to remember that bullying has been something that's been going on. You know, since certainly since I was a kid, and probably well before it. And I remember reading this book called The Bully of Barkham Street, and it just really affected me because it, it took the bully's point of view and made you realize that behind every person who you think is mean and horrible and a bully is a backstory, and often the backstory is something that will make you more sympathetic to that bully and make you understand his or her motivations. I just, and for some reason, that book has always stood in my head as one that made me think a little differently about the kids around me. Um, today, I would say, I just read Where'd You Go, Bernadette, and loved it. Um, my, just my favorite contemporary or reasonably contemporary adult novels are 
are varied and wide and as you know Lonesome Dove and Catch-22 and The Magus by John Fowles and um, also Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk is another book I read kind of recently so yeah it is good and I, uh, I, I try to read as much as I can um, balancing between kids books and adult books um, which is a real challenge but Mostly when I when I when it comes right down to it, I'm, I still prefer to read adult contemporary novels, fiction. Okay, and for Mr. Bowen, I wasn't going to ask you the same question though. If you'd like oh, to okay. answer it, you can. My question to you is about one of your characters. So, uh, well, I'll answer the book about or the uh, question about the books because I had so much time to think about it. Um, the Oops. not another train, is it? But the, uh, uh, when I was growing up, and I didn't go to middle school, I went to Catholic school. That's very, very different. You know, there was no middle school, no elementary school. You're all in the same place. It's sort of, it's kind of like prison. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but uh, it, they did teach you wonderfully. I, I must say that. Um, I love these uh, kids' sports books. They were called the Chip Hilton uh, Stories. And uh, they were written in the 1940s through the early 1960s by a guy named Claire B, who was a wonderful uh, basketball coach. And uh, in fact, I was one of those kids that would talk all the times, and the, the nuns didn't want me talking. And so they would allow me to slip the books underneath my desk, and I would read them. Uh, and so those were the ones uh, that, <coughs> that really spoke uh, to me. And they did a bunch of things. They convinced me first that reading was a great deal of fun. Uh, two, the character of Chip was somebody who was very admirable. He was a good student. He was a good person. He was a good. Um, he wasn't great at everything, but he was a great athlete. I will say that. But and so that oh, I wanted to be that, you know. And so, kind of gave me something to shoot for. Uh, my I was the sixth of seven children, so there was an incredible advantage of having people come home from college in the late 60s uh, and just hand you books. And so I read very widely, still do. By the way, one of the things I do is I keep track of all the books that I read. And I would really, as we get older, uh, make that suggestion because, uh, because it reminds you. By the way, I think somebody, Lynn Olson's going to be here. Citizens of London is a great book by her. It is fabulous. It is a wonderful history of uh, 1939 to 1941 in England. I love histories. So, you had a question about uh, character. What about your character, Devro Beach? Because it looked as if he <laughs> appeared in more than one book, and I, that might be the only one that I noticed so far. And then after that, I'd love it if Mr. Greenwald would kind of uh, explain his shirt, show it to us, and are they on sale too? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the character that she's referring to actually uh, is Devro Beach, D-E-V-R-O, and then just Beach, uh, was, is in quarterback season, as I recall. By the way, I, I'm not good with names. Uh, the reason he's named Devro Beach is there is a beach in um, my hometown of Marblehead, Massachusetts, which is Devro. D-E-V-E-R-E-A-U-X. And so uh, it was sort of, we always liked the, the sound of it. And uh, one of the things that's really interesting is that when you write a lot of uh, uh, sports books, you need a lot of names. And so where I get my names is uh, interesting. Lots of times I will take out a uh, uh, sort of a, uh, you know, the directory of a school, and I'll start picking out popular names. Or I pick out names that were popular of kids who were born 10 years ago. Uh, I also, kids who write me, I put their names in books. I have auctioned off names for charitable purposes. The highest I believe it ever went, $900 to get a, uh, uh, and it went to a school. So there are all sorts of ways uh, to get uh, names because I need names for lineups, for rosters, for the other team, uh, and so it's kind of fun how you get the names. But everyone, my wife actually named that character. And one time, I I had written the book, 
And my wife is my first editor, and before I had sent it off to the editor, she, she had, without telling me, changed one of the names of a character in the book. So when I was talking to my editor in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, she was referring to somebody, and I was thinking, who is that? I had no idea. I, I kept kind of hinting around, but then she told me later, oh, Bo, I didn't like that name, so I changed it. 31 years I've been married. It takes a lot, you know. <laughs> you have to give her, yeah, she had wanted to do that. But names are really interesting, yeah. Uh, the shirt uh, came about actually, um, I think, as I mentioned before, there are these tips in the first Charlie Joe book, and, and as I said, one of them is all about how he convinces his parents he really is a reader, even though he doesn't like to read books, and he, he puts, compiles a list of all the ways that he does read, and on that list is t-shirts. All you have to do is talk to a friend who has a shirt who has the words on it, like this guy and this guy, and you've read. So I said, you know what, I should do a, I should do a sh my own shirt with some reading on it. So I designed this Charlie Joe Jackson shirt. It's got a list on the back. And can I have a volunteer? Does anybody want to come up here and read the list? You already volunteered. There's reading involved. You want to come? All right, come on. Let's take this microphone. All right. What's your name? Andrew? Andrew, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, Andrew's going to read the back of my shirt. Top 10 things to do instead of reading. 10, eating. 9, watching TV. 8, playing video games. 7, shopping. 6, playing with your dog. 5, exercising. 4, texting. 3, sleeping. 2, pretending to read. 1, feeling sorry for other kids who are reading. <laughs> Nice job, Andrew. Good job. You've now read enough for the day. You can go play outside. <laughs> oh, we are outside, and it's raining a little bit. Anyway, that's the backstory of the uh, of the shirt. Can we do another question? Sure. Uh, uh -oh, okay. I I would ask my father Tommy a question, but I can ask him on the train ride home. So my question's for Fred. Um, when I was growing up, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but I'm from Connecticut, and one great baseball moment that uh, sticks out in my head is uh, when Derek Jeter, he ran into the stands to catch a foul ball, and I remember the next day in school, it was all my friends talked about, and it was something that made me fall in love with baseball, uh, and I was wondering, Fred, your love of baseball is, and sports is so apparent if there was one play, player, or team or game uh, early on in your childhood that, that helped you fall in love with sports and baseball? Well, I can tell you as somebody who is from Massachusetts, it wasn't anybody on the Yankees. Um, actually, one of the things I think that has been wonderful about Bryce Harper showing up uh, in, uh, with the Nationals, and kids love, of course, Bryce Harper. He's like this magical creature. But what's great is you will see this list of players who were great at 19 years old or at 20 years old. And you'll recognize a lot of the names. You'll see Willie Mays or Hank Aaron or you know older names like Mel Ott. But there's one name on that list that most people don't recognize. And the name is Tony Canigliaro. And right now I'm getting goosebumps because Tony Canigliaro came from the town next to my town. He came up at, I believe, age 18, and it was in 1964 for the Red Sox. By age 20, he was leading the major leagues in home runs. He is e either he or Mel Lott is the youngest guy ever to hit a home or ever to hit a hundred home runs. He was this incredible player. Tragically, he is hit August 18th, 1967, in California by a Jack Hamilton fastball, which hurt his vision. He was out the next year. He actually came back and hit 36 home runs. He was a tremendous player, but eventually his eyesight couldn't, uh, wasn't good enough to play. But, I mean, he was a thrilling, 
thrilling player. The Red Sox were, of course, a lesson in endurance for most of my life. <laughs> and in fact, I remember, I was hoping, and I'll give away my political leanings here, I was hoping actually that George W. Bush would not be reelected in 2004. And I told my friends, I said, oh, I would have given up the world, the Red Sox winning the World Series for him not to be reelected. <laughs> and people were shocked because I was a, lifelong Red Sox fan. But then I said to him, but I wouldn't have given up the Red Sox beating the Yankees. <laughs> you know, coming back from three games down. That was perfect. So, no, it wasn't Derek Jeter. That was a wonderful, and he is an admirable player, but he is a Yankee. You can never forget that. And by the way, anybody who roots for them, the Yankees is not from New England. <laughs> I think we, if there's one more question, I think we, we literally have time for one more. Yeah, this guy right here. Uh, well, I am planning to write a book. This is an interesting one. In the third Charlie Joe Jackson book, at this camp, Camp Rita Bookie, he meets a kid named Jack Strong. And Jack Strong is the opposite of Charlie Joe. He's a big reader, he's a, he's a great student. He loves to learn, but, but he has a problem. And his problem is that he does too many things. He runs around to a few too many activities. His parents have scheduled him for a lot of stuff, and he's overscheduled. So my next book is actually all about Jack Strong, the kid that Charlie Joe meets. And in that book, he finally gets tired of going from activity to activity to activity, because he likes some of them, but he also doesn't like a lot of them. Freight train! So I'm gonna talk fast. Anyway, it's about his, his situation where he finally gets fed up, he goes on strike and refuses to get up from his couch until his parents let him drop some of his activities. I'm gonna write a book about a train. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do. No, my next book is gonna be a uh, foot, football book and it'll come out uh, the fall of 2014. But I think I gotta work a train into it. <laughs> Thank you all for coming Thank you, up. Everybody.